such an honor to be here with you today. Um, I hope the energy is still strong, as I'm super excited to share you my thoughts on this topic with you all. So without further ado, let's dive into that and get started. But before that, uh, let me introduce myself um, real quick. My name is Glenn. I'm from Vienna, Austria, so uh, I took a 15-hour flight to get here, which ended up being a 26-hour journey after all, but I'm super glad that I made it still. I'm now a uh, developer relations engineer at Kadena, which is an uh, innovative multi-chain blockchain company. So I'm super, super thrilled to be uh, there to advance their front end and React uh, ecosystem. I'm, I'm at GL double N, R-O-S, on pretty much all the social channels that, you know, that handle might look weird, but it's just really my name, Glenn Reyes, but without the ease. So, oh, sorry about that. I was super nervous. Oh. All right, let's do it again. So, oh, okay. Today I'm here to talk about, oh man, uh, oh, I uh, know why, oops, wrong slide, <laughs> crap, so nervous, ah, oh, no way, oh, click fix, click to fix, oops, so, sorry about that, sorry about that, um, so, welcome to my talk about the things that we can't get enough of, arrows. It's basically the thing that probably everyone's, uh, every one of us uh, loves, and, but not only, but no one uh, wants to talk about. So it's the thing that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, that, that's the thing that occurs wherever and whenever, and most often on occasions where we totally don't want it. So, um, let's talk about facts of errors. So, errors uh, are shipped to production, regardless of what we think. So, part of my research uh, about that was trying to reproduce uh, different kinds of errors to see how they look like. So, I was trying to figure out a way um, on how to do this. And I think, for most cases, they look actually super good. So, I tried to, with checking the 404 pages of some websites, like uh, this one. So, anyone has seen this before? Uh, so, yeah, this is supposed to be like a 404 page, and if anyone can give me the link or access to the code base, I'd love to sprinkle that with a bit more love. And here's another one, like, it's saying 404 now, and that's what happened, which is accurate. But there is, like, no way out, like, what can I click now? Back? Or, you know, where can I go from here? Or how about react.dev? So that's a lot better. As we can see, like tons of ways out the React Talks is giving me, like letting me know through a link to their GitHub issues if that was a mistake, or how, how about like taking a survey about how we like the docs. So imagine you're trying to open a link uh, to, someone doc, to, some, to some docs that aren't there, but you're suggested to take a survey. So definitely something that I, can, that I think can be easily improved on uh, user experience-wise. Now, what, all, uh, what also often happen uh, is that uh, when, when you encounter errors, uh, it can often be confusing and annoying. So, more so with unclear or like, cryptic, unreadable error messages. So, this can lead to a poor user experience and may cause users to abandon the application. Also, uh, errors can prevent users from complete, uh, completing their intended tasks or actions within the app. So this can lead to dissatisfaction and to potential loss of user or customers. Errors can lead to loss of data, especially in React apps, where it can sometimes lead to data loss or corruption, resulting in a loss of user-generated content or changes. So this can be particularly frustrating for users and may cause them to seek for alternatives. Frequent errors like application crashes or when your application doesn't respond can uh, result in users losing trust or reduced trust in the, uh, in the app or the product. So this can ne negatively impact the reputation of the application uh, and the team or organization behind it. Encountering errors can waste users' time as they may uh, attempt to find workarounds or seek assistance, which can, again, lead to a negative perception of the application and a decrease uh, in user satisfaction. 
And the worst case scenario, errors can lead to loss of revenues or even loss of customers' money. So if there is a lot of issues, people might not buy things, use the Apple S or stop being like loyal customers. So this can easily hurt a business's uh, situation. So we are developers, and I believe that we should probably take errors and error handling um, at least as serious as regular work like feature development. But not only us as developers, but also anyone else on the team. So may it be like pr product managers or engineer managers, anyone from marketing or UX uh, designers or writers. So the bigger the app scales, the more chances error uh, are going to happen, regardless how much we care about and test against it or not. In this case, where we know that these types of things may occur, um, I think we should spend at least the e uh, equal amount of energy for making these a great experience as with other uh, type of work we do. And we shouldn't just think about or do something against error handling, or do error handling, but we should try to provide errors that are going to be helpful for the users. So note that the user, the, the individual who receives an error, can be, can be us uh, developers working on, for example, our, our local machines, or your, um, your actual user of your production side. So it's often helpful to provide uh, a precise error through better error handling to the user for a better user experience. So more so, if we keep consciously prevent our apps from errors via testing, et cetera, we can have a better experience for the users right away. So one strategy of how to tackle this is something I like to call uh, defensive programming. So it's basically a concept, of, uh, a concept or a design that allows for uh, producing more bulletproof code that are consciously safe and robust against bugs and problems by uh, improving like, uh, general code quality and making the source code more comprehensible. So one example of, uh, of a setup that can have a better code save is this. So this actually happened to me um, in a real world app, which cost me about like 30,000 US dollars for shipping that in production. So what this basically does is it's fetching for a Boolean to display something, whether a depositor is allowed to see some advanced cooling or not. So the problem, here, the problem here was that the variable is supposed to be a, uh, the query response. So that's really just a, a React query uh, hook wrapper that just returns a React query response. But the entire response object was mistakenly used as the uh, condition here, resulting the uh, else part to be never executed. So um, this is a mistake um, of the entire team, like me as the author, and also code reviewers and testers that have missed it. So one way to prevent this problem is through code safety. So by providing a linting rule like strict Boolean expressions for checking that. So for this particular, uh, for this particular uh, use case, we didn't want to have that for every primitive, but specifically mostly for Booleans, numbers, and strings. And thankfully, the linting rule for that allowed us for configuring and fine-tune this rule. So that means whenever this condition does not resolve a Boolean, um, like in this case with the if condition, then we get a linting error, which is great to prevent us from this particular problem again. So with that, we were able to discover uh, incorrect responses, response types right away and prevent hard to find troubles later. That's just one example of what measures can be done for defensive programming and for better code safety. Now, Arrows in React. So this is what you get when you spin up a uh, Next or Remix app and just throw an error in, in a triggered event, event handler. So it's actually looking pretty good. The thing is that um, the errors are just unhandled out of, the, out of the box. So what can we do about it? So in React, there is a special th thing called uh, error boundary. And both frameworks have their own uh, enhancements uh, with React, React error boundaries. So uh, yeah, let's take a quick review on how a error boundary uh, look like. So basically what it is, it's a uh, component that catches JavaScript errors anywhere in its uh, child component tree and handles these. And to implement an error, you'll need to provide this lifecycle method static uh, get derived state from error. And you can think of it of a special state setter that triggers uh, when an error is thrown in its children. 
And optionally, you can uh, also implement the component did catch lifecycle method to add some more logic, like reporting the error to an external uh, monitoring service. And then on render, you can determine whether the re to return uh, just its children or an error fallback. You can also have multiple error boundaries and nest them. So when an error is thrown within its uh, child component, uh, the nearest error boundary catches it and then captures the error so it can display a fallback like right on this part. Or uh, perform like recovery actions depending on your uh, implemented logic. Something that I found quite funny actually um, and interesting is that when you search for error boundaries in the React docs, you'll find them under legacy React APIs in the component section, which I think makes absolute sense as the only way to create a component with the capabilities of an error boundary is by uh, using the lifecycle method, uh, get the React state from error and component catch. So in fact, according to the docs, um, class components are still supported by React. They aren't recommended by uh, being used in uh, new code uh, bases anymore, though. So that makes absolute sense, but I don't think there is any other use case that requires you to actually write a class component in your app. So scrolling, scrolling further down, you can see the node linking to this uh, third-party uh, React error boundary package by Brian that covers pretty much uh, all error boundary use cases that you would ever need. So personally, I think that deserves more emphasis uh, rather than being a small node section in the legacy AP, uh, React APIs. So something I think can definitely be improved on. Let's talk about error messages. Uh, but before I, uh, I get into error messages that are targeted for non-technical people, I think it's helpful to share you guys some really helpful um, VS Code extensions that can help with reducing friction when reading like TypeScript-specific error messages in your editor. So one super highly recommended one that I personally love is that awesome Pretty TS extension. Uh, which basically adds styling into uh, your TS errors to make them more readable for us developers. So super cool. Another super helpful one is uh, the TS error translator by Matt Spacock. Um, this can be especially uh, handy for folks who want to uh, have a bit more explanations instead and have them uh, a bit more human readable with uh, you know links. Uh, and reference to the docs. So super helpful, especially for the ones who are you know, learning or want, want to enhance their knowledge in TypeScript. And then there is um, VS Code Error Lens. This is great when you have like, a lot of problems at once, and this allows you to see them at a glance. So really awesome, especially for you know, educators teaching and uh, reviewing TypeScript errors. Now. Let's get a bit deeper uh, into writing error messages for non-technical people. But I don't want to um, get into just writing error messages, but I want to get a bit deeper into writing better error messages. So here is everyone's default error message. Whoops, something went wrong. So yeah. And yeah, there's me who thought, yeah, this can be improved super easily by you know, adding it with a bit more context and explanations for what happened. So, yeah, it's better, but I think um, there is a couple of uh, problems with that still. And first is um, you know the the weird tone. So imagine imagine like um, a doctor performing a procedure and then suddenly saying, "Oops, something went wrong. Sorry about that." This is the last <laughs> this is the last thing anyone wants to hear uh, when the stakes are high. You know, whether it's a surgery or uh, someone's source of income. Um, we want to show the users that uh, we know it's serious and we understand it's important to them. Secondly, um, the technical jargon. So even in today's world of you know, user-centered design, technical jargon often still pre uh, present and sneaks um, its way into error messages, like we can't fetch your data or you know, my credentials were denied. Like, what? Credentials? You know? So the technical stuff um, is not super important to the user at all. So they just want to know what went wrong, how to fix it. Third um, is passing the blame. So try to focus on the problem rather than the action that led to the problem. They don't want to think about other platforms. And also, we don't want to shame the users, even if there's something dated uh, uh, is why they're seeing a certain error message. And lastly, like uh, generic messages for no reason. 
So sometimes we don't want to cause the error, but sometimes we do. So if uh, we know what caused the error and we're not telling them, we're doing our users the ultimate disservice. So instead, say what happened and why. So make it super clear what did happen. This can also be done with a um, you know, combination of visuals uh, and text. Explain why the user got this error, like even if the, um, the only explanation is that there was a technical issue. Provide, us, provide reassurance. So sometimes you may have uh, transactional logic where you'd uh, just roll back your mutations entirely, but sometimes it's helpful when things can be actually partially completed. So where possible, uh, let them know what was not affected by the error. For example, where um, the change is still saved as a draft, even though their email wasn't sent or whatever. You know. Um, help them fix it. So tell them exactly what to do if there is a way to possibly fix it. While you don't want to be overly apologetic, uh, you still want to use please if the situation warrants it. Maybe it's um, a really dire situation um, or it's something that's, that we absolutely uh, can't help. So in that case, we want to use please uh, to emphasize it even more. Um, and lastly, always give a way out. So a great way to do that, and I personally re really love uh, on also developer-faced errors, are links to, for example, to an article or links to somewhere to get actual help, like customer care or whatever. Now, I'd love to touch uh, on a couple of error messages, uh, error message use cases in forms. As I think um, that forms are something that we um, most often work on and can, after all, have a significant impact if error handling aren't done uh, effectively. So first, um, avoid, please, premature uh, React error messages. So here's an example on one of the largest television uh, companies that produces displays. So what happened here is as, as you begin typing your zip code, you already see errors showing up and persist until five numbers uh, have been typed. This often, help, this often happens also on email, uh, email fields, uh, like here on this website of an American healthcare company called LabCorp in their payment portal. So same thing, that gives us already an error message, uh, even if we haven't actually finished typing the email yet. Another example can happen is with dates made of you know, different dropdowns. So obviously, you want to make sure that you start validating once the user has entered both the month and the day with your birth, and not only one of them. Use error styling for errors only. So here, um, the uh, non-critical error saying important messages, uh, no attachment to display, makes it look like it's important uh, due you know, to its, its visual warning and uh, of its yellow styling, where I think the information uh, seems uh, more, uh, more important than it really is. So a bad example is like here on uh, the now deprecated Amazon Glow's mobile app, where they only use yellow coloring uh, on their icon to make this information look a little less prominent and less distracting. And um, allowing users to click that away is also a great thing um, for reducing cognitive load. Here's another example of a note that can be improved on, uh, where in this checkout process, the red visual box uh, and caution symbol makes like useful information feel like an error message. So and it creates the perception that the uh, user has made a mistake, although it's more, you know, more of a warning. So in contrast, um, I like how PayPal's mobile application has done it to uh, display non-era uh, notifications with like a subtle uh, gray background coloring and information icon. So bottom line, um, wait until a user moves on uh, from a field to display an error message related to, appropriate, uh, to, a, to an appropriate format, like zip code, email messages, dates, etc. Provide any constraints up front. So do not wait until the uh, user begins typing or um, attempts to submit the entry. Once you determine that the user has finished uh, typing an input, you may already know that the input is not valid. And you may want to display the error instead of waiting until the user submits. Use an asterisk uh, to mark required fields or annot annotate uh, required fields with the word uh, required. But do not overload the user with like, multiple indicators, like uh, combining asterisks with uh, red outlined fields and inline validation. 
message. Um, only display additional elements um, if and after the user uh, attempts uh, to submit a form or a page without filling it uh, without, without filling in required fields, like you know uh, increasing the attention that these fields are required. Lastly, um, reserve error like visual things like you know uh, red text, uh, red box, uh, caution, and warning symbols for you know uh, more critical uh, system system status messages that are meant to disrupt the user's workflow. So to wrap up my talk, I want to emphasize a couple of takeaways that I hope can help uh, us to make errors and error handling uh, overall a better experience. Establish a cross-functional team to focus on error handling. A team that is made up of product managers, uh, front-end and back-end developers, UX designers and UX writers. So the goal is to make sure proper error handling is part of uh, the product uh, lifecycle, not an afterthought. View it as a shared responsibility. So everyone is responsible for making uh, sure we're handling errors properly. So also non-developers can help con contribute on that by placing you know, more emphasis on errors and edge cases, not always just the happy path. Developers can investigate and uh, document errors according to guidelines on their platform. Review errors multiple times, even uh, if it's not you know, your current task, especially with you know, brand new products. Plan some time to uh, go through possible errors that might occur. This allows uh, to catch some of the biggest and obvious errors can be prevented from uh, being reported by an actual user. And this can be even done by planning uh, or uh, writing more tests to prevent uh, du duplicated work. Also note that errors uh, are um, you know, an, on an ongoing review process. Error messages and error handling can always be further improved and optimized. So it's a good idea you know, to schedule uh, an ongoing time to handle these. And last but not least, be empathetic um, to, uh, as, as possible to a user. So in 99% of the cases, there might be a better way than our, than our generic... <laughs> Whoops, something went wrong. That's it. Thank you very much.